We're going to continue our study this morning of the enemy within. The enemy within. Let's go to Jeremiah 29, 11, please. Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Glory to God. Isn't it good to know that God only has thoughts of good towards us? We sometimes think that bad things come from him, but he only has good thoughts. Every thought that our Heavenly Father has towards us is good. Always good. And so whatever he says in his word are words to us and they're only good. He has a good plan and purpose for us. Ephesians 2.10. Ephesians 2.10. Hallelujah. Ephesians 2.10. For we are his workmanship. Everybody say, "I I am God's workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus. Unto good works. Hallelujah. He's created us for good works. That's his plan and purpose from before the foundation of the world is for us to have good works. But Satan has been working to steal the plan. But how does he steal that plan? And through the process of this, I believe we're going to see it. But we have given Satan so much credit through preconceived erroneous ideas that we just let him run wild. And every time something doesn't happen, every time we don't receive what we should, every time things go wrong against us, we're blaming the devil. When it's really the enemy within Philippians 3, you know, we all know when it comes to to going to school, to working, to having a trade, doing whatever we do, we know it takes time. You have to study, you have to apply yourself. Or if you even want a meal, you don't say, meal, I want you, and you look at whatever food is there and you're wondering, why isn't it cooked? Or you see this plate of food and you're starving to death and you say, I see the food. Why isn't it doing something? But when it comes to spiritual things, we just sort of think, oh, well, here I am, God, whatever you want. You know, that silly little song, que sera, sera, whatever will be, will be. Well, definitely it will be if we don't do something to stop that death cycle. So looking at Philippians chapter 3, 13 and 14. New Living Translation. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it. But I focus. Everybody say, focus. I focus. What are you focusing on this one thing? He said, focus on this one thing. Not a thousand things, one thing. Forgetting those things that are past and what we're forgetting that. So we're not focusing on what's past. What happened yesterday? What happened an hour ago? What happened five minutes ago? It said focus on one thing, looking forward to what lies ahead. What is lying ahead? The plan and purpose God has for your life. The kingdom of God within. And he says, I strain to reach the end of the race. So in order to reach the end of our race, in order to achieve the plan and purpose God has for us, in order to complete what he's called us to do, there's some straining. There's some working. We're always working at something, either positive or negative. I strain to reach the end of the race and receive the prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us up to heaven. The message translation of verse 14 says, I'm often running and I'm not turning back. Jesus said, when you put your hand to the plow, don't look back. Once you've committed yourself, Rick Renner says, determination, the key to success in life. If you truly want to succeed, you can't allow anything to stop you from pressing ahead toward the fulfillment of God's revealed will for your life. Determination. 
You make a quality decision. You are determined to see the end result of what Jesus died for for your life. And you don't let some frivolous thing of the here and now that satisfies and gratifies the flesh to stop you from going forward because that's the enemy within that'll stop you. It's not Satan, it's not your mother, it's not your uncle, it's not your brother, it's not your husband, it's not your wife, it's not your employer, and it's not your employees. There's one thing that'll stop you, and it's when you don't become determined and you lose your focus on what God's called you to do and to be, and that's the enemy within. Matthew 16, we looked at this scripture Last week, Matthew 16, verse 18. And I say unto thee, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. As I said, I was listening to Willie George, and he said, he was talking about the church, and he says, the gates of hell will not prevail against it, but what will destroy the church comes from within. And that's when the Holy Spirit said, and that's what will destroy our walk with God, is what's in us. Well, ultimately, what's in us will then destroy the church, too, because we're part of the church. And whatever is causing us a problem inside will eventually come out and will cause a problem in the church. You see, Satan is defeated. He's defeated. Jesus spoiled principalities and powers and rulers of the darkness of this age. He made an open show of them. He is defeated. So why are so many Christians running around having problems with the devil? When he's already defeated. New Living, uh, the uh, verse 23 of Matthew 16 Verse 23, now Peter had this revelation. He spoke this, wow. And then he turns around and says, tells Jesus, no, no, you're not going to go to the cross, no. And then in verse 23, Jesus says, get behind me, Satan, you are an offense to me. For you savor us not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. The New Living Translation says that you um, don't understand the things of God. You're not honoring the things of God. Let me just find that to make it. You are seeing things merely from a human point of view. And that is so serious for us that we don't look at things from a human point of view. We are in the kingdom of God. And that kingdom is within us. It's not coming from the outside. It's in us. When we got born again, the kingdom of God is in us. The word of God tells us that. And then we're told in chapter 6 of of Matthew, take no thought saying what you're going to eat and what you're going to wear. Don't get into anxiety. But we also saw the biggest problem. You know, we talk about wolves in sheep's clothing in the church, false teachers, false prophets coming in to destroy the flock from within. Mental assent looks good, tastes good, and you think it is the real thing, and it isn't. Mental assent, assent means the expression of approval or agreement. And with mental assent, because it's never gotten from our head to our heart. We've never taken the time to get it in our mind to our spirit man. And the power of faith is released from our spirit. And if it's all up here, there's only mental power and that won't cut it. That won't do it. And it gets us discouraged. We become discouraged, lethargic, sluggish, apathetic, showing no enthusiasm, interest, or concern, and you feel trapped where you are. People just give up on the word because I've done it. I've read it. I've read it. I've listened to it. I've read it. I've listened to it. And it doesn't work. And they get discouraged. And so maybe once a week they hear the word if they come to church once a week. 
And I'm not down on anybody. I'm not criticizing that person. I'm saying you have been in a state of mentally assenting to the word. And you think it's faith. And it isn't faith. And that enemy from within is destroying you. Not you, you, but you, the body of Christ. I want to make sure nobody thinks I'm going, you. It's serious. Because we have spoken faith statements. We've spoken things. And it doesn't work. And we want to know why. And we know God has a plan for us. And we want to walk in that plan. And we want to see that purpose fulfilled in our life. And then sometimes we know it. And through fear or figuring I can't do it. Or it's too late for me. We don't do it. We allow mental assent to get in. We say the right things. It looks right. It smells right. Might even taste right. But it's not the real thing. I want to draw a parallel to another scripture that Jesus had. Let's look at Luke 6. Luke chapter 6, please. Did Jesus ever speak a command to anything and not have it work? And he said, the works that I do shall ye do also, and greater works than these shall ye do, because I go to my Father. But when it's mental assent, we speak things and we say things and we don't hear what the Father wants us to say and it doesn't work. Genesis 6, uh, pardon me, Luke 6. We might get time to go to Genesis later. So, remember, every parable, Jesus said, if you can't, And don't understand the parable of the sower, where the sower sows the word. You won't be able to understand any parable. So when he's speaking a parable or talking about it, let's remember, that is the basis for all parables to be interpreted. So in Luke chapter 6, verse 45, um, I'm going to, well, let's read it out of, um, I'll do the message. Verse 45, it's who you are, not what you say and do that counts. We say a lot of things, we might do some things. Your true being brims over into true words and deeds. Verse 46, why are you so polite with me, always saying, yes, sir, and that's right, sir, but never doing a thing, I tell you. Verse 47, these words, maybe this is 48, these words I speak to you, listen to this. He is saying here, the words I speak to you are not mere additions to your life. Homeowner improvements to your standard of living. They are foundation words, words to build a life on. These are not archaic words that have no meaning. The word of God is powerful. It's alive, it's active, it's energized with Holy Spirit power. They're not add-ons. You go buy a car and you want add-ons, or you're going to have a meal, and so you want, oh, well, maybe we'll have some appetizers and do some add-ons. But you could do without them. Jesus says these are not add-ons, you cannot do without them. Verse 48, if you work the words into your life, you are like a smart carpenter who dug deep and laid the foundation of his house on bedrock. When the river burst its banks and crashed against the house, nothing could shake it. It was built to last. So what is the foundation? The word. It's the word. But let's look at what mental ass- happens when it's nothing but mental assent. When you've just sort of figured, well, that's the word, you know. It's an add-on. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Yeah, yeah. The word works. Yeah. 
The word is alive. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And you can speak all the right things and say all the right things. And like we studied with the glory, when the pressure's on, what's coming out? Are you going to be crushed? Or are you just going to look like the rest of the world? But if you just use my words in Bible studies and don't work them into your life, you are like a dumb carpenter who built a house but skipped the foundation. When the swollen river came crashing in, it collapsed like a house of cards. It was a total loss. If you build anything of your life on any foundation other than the word of God, when the storms come, you'll crash. The only thing you'll have to draw on is the way the world does it. Mental ascent. It looks great from the outside, but has no substance. Then when pressure comes and we speak the word, nothing happens. It doesn't work. And we wonder why. Because we've been deceived by that enemy from within. Mental ascent. And I want to show another scripture showing that because I don't want you to think I'm just taking it out of context. But remember, we said, thief comes to steal, kill, destroy. He cannot kill and destroy you until he's stolen the word. But if it's mental ascent, you've never had the word in you. Whose fault is that? That's not the devil's fault. Jesus defeated, I'll say it again, Jesus defeated the devil, stripped him of all his power against the body of Christ. And Jesus said the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. Everybody here is part of the church. Therefore, the gates of hell should not prevail against any of us. It just shouldn't. So Satan's attempt is always to steal the word. That's what he's stealing. People said, well, Satan came and stole my car. He didn't steal your car until he first stole the word. And if the word is in there and somebody tried to steal your car, you speak to it and it'll come back. And the one big thing, huge And basically, I think, might be just the only thing. He steals the word and afflictions, persecutions, but the big thing is being offended. Now, to be offended and to not like something or like somebody are not the same thing. But offense will always cause strife. Offense is always a case of um, when you're looking at offense in the realm of mental ascent. It's a case of, you. usually you start not getting offended at other people, but you get offended with God. That's, Eve was offended with God. God hasn't changed the way of doing, I mean, God hasn't changed and Satan's still doing it the same way. And it comes this way Eve became offended because the devil told her that God was holding out on her. If you eat the fruit, you will be like God. And that's why he doesn't want you. He's holding out and you'll be wise and all the rest of it. We get offended because we think God's holding out. You get offended for the word's sake. It's not because somebody sprayed fluorescent pink on your house and you're offended at that person. That's not what we're... You're offended because of the word. The word didn't do what you thought it should do. God didn't come through for you. God didn't do what you think God should do. And you're offended. Now Satan is able to steal that word. Well, I guess if you're offended with God, it's not going to work. So let's go to James... Chapter 1, 
James chapter 1. James chapter 1. I'm going to read out of the message to begin with. Might do the New Living as well. But James chapter 1, verse 21, the message. So throw message James 1, 21. So throw all spoiled virtue and cancerous evil in the garbage. Anything contrary to the word of God is evil. It's twisted. In simple humility, let our gardener, God, landscape you with the word, making a salvation gardener, garden of your life. God wants to clean us up. God wants to get his word in us. God gave Jesus. He shed his blood so we can walk in victory. So we can walk above what Satan's trying to do. He's given us authority in this earth. So we don't have to be tossed to and fro. Verse 22. Don't fool yourself into thinking that you are a listener when you are anything but. Letting the word go in one ear and out the other. Act on what you hear. Now is that not saying the same thing as building your foundation? Those who hear and don't act are like those who glance in the mirror. Walk away and two minutes later have no idea who they are or what they look like. But whoever catches a glimpse of the revealed, notice it says revealed counsel of God. We're not going to find out what God's plan and purpose is for our life if we spend all of our time in the secular realm and even if we just sort of read the word but we don't fellowship with our Heavenly Father and commune with the Holy Spirit. It's by the Holy Spirit in our spirit that God reveals his plan and purpose for our life. But that takes time. And sometimes... It seems like we just soon go barging through a door, end up with calamity, get mad at God, and then barge through another door, more calamity, more mad at God, go through another door, and just try, well, you know, it's like shots on goal. The more you shoot, maybe you'll get one in. I just might go through the right door. We could save all that heartache by just finding out what God's plan is. And then it'll already be blessed. But whoever catches a glimpse of the revealed counsel of God, the free life. You know, people think it's bondage going to church and bondage to be a Christian and and all reading the word. You're doing something with your life and it's either adding to your life or taking from your life. There is no such thing as a stagnant Life, A stagnant thing of water just is full of, of slime. I don't know if you've ever driven by, seen a pond. It has no in and no out, and it's just a slime. It's, so with God, it's a free life. Free from sickness and disease. Free from poverty. Free from the curse in any way. We've been redeemed from the curse, but we're putting it and believing it and not allowing our mind to just go wild with the world system. Even out of the corner of his eye and sticks with it is no distracted scatterbrain, but a man or woman of action. That person will find delight and affirmation in the action. Anyone who sets himself up as religious by talking a good game is self-deceived. This kind of religion is hot air and only hot air. Nothing but mental ascent. The storms come. Your foundation is not on the rock of Jesus Christ and the word of God. It's nothing but hot air. New Living says, if you claim to be religious but don't control your tongue, you are just fooling yourself and your religion is worthless. 
So we're to be a doer of the word. And we're going to, we will get to looking at how to get from mental ascent to faith. But just for a few minutes, I'm going to introduce you to somebody in the word that had mental ascent. And what happened? Because of this man's mental ascent. Until he got to the place where he no longer was walking by mental ascent, but faith. Where he went to the place, and once I say this, you'll probably know who I'm referring to, until he became fully persuaded. So let's go to Genesis. We're going to see what mental ascent does, and we're going to see some characteristics of it. Genesis chapter 12, please. Genesis chapter 12. Verse 1. Genesis chapter 12, verse 1, 2, and 3. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house unto a land I will show you. Get away from your family. Now I'm not telling anybody to get away from their family here. But their family were um, sun worshippers, etc., moon worshippers. Now God's saying, I'm going to show you a land, but you've got to get away from your family. You've got to break those religious ties. You keep pulling in unbelief, you keep pulling in crazy religions into your life, it will starve you. It'll kill. So he's saying, get away from it. Verse 2, and I will make, here, here's what God's promising him. You leave, leave your father's house. I will make thee a great nation. I will bless thee. There's the blessing. Fruitful, multiply, replenish, subdue, take dominion, exercise authority, and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. You'll be a blessing to the rest of the world. It won't be just for me and my four and no more. And I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curses thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Now, hey, God, that doesn't mean if somebody came against Abraham, God was going to curse him. You got to read that in original. And what it really is, is God saying, somebody, you know, the blessing's on David. And I'm this person outside the blessing. Now I start blessing him, helping him to be prosperous. The blessing comes back to me. But now if I cut off David from my life and I try and destroy him, I've cut off my source of blessing. Now the word reveals the blessing to us. When we cut off the word, we're cutting off the blessing flowing. We are blessed. But we can cut it off and not walk in it. So anyway, I wanted to make clear that nobody thought here God was cursing people. That's not what that means there. So anyway, here, the blessing was given. All you have to do, Abraham, is leave your family and I'll show you where to go. So we have to do something first and then God will show. Verse 5, and Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot. He didn't even get out of town and he disobeyed. I think he had mental assent there. The blessing was given to him. And he packs up and he takes Lot. Disobeys. And it caused problems. He disobeyed. So then let's go to verse 11. And it came to pass when he was come near to enter into Egypt that he said unto Sarai his wife, Behold now, I know that thou art a fair woman to look upon. Therefore it shall come to pass when the Egyptians shall see thee that they shall say, This is his wife, and they will kill me, but they will save thee alive. Say, I pray thee, thou art my sister, that it may be well with me for thy sake, and my soul shall live because of thee. Did he have faith in the blessing or was he mentally assenting to the blessing? Because the blessing promised protection. The blessing said he would be a blessing. 
And his name would be great. He needs a wife for this. He mentally assented to the blessing. Because you can see by his behavior what he did. He didn't have confidence in the blessing. He mentally assented to it. Chapter 13. Verse 7 and 8. Now he, as I said, taking Lot caused a problem. And he was afraid. He had fear entering in. Verse 7 of chapter 13. And there was a what? Strife. Strife. Things were happening. He was in fear. But now there's strife because he disobeyed God. There's strife. Between the herdsmen of Abram's cattle and the herdsmen of Lot's cattle, taking his family along caused a problem when God said not to. And the Canaanite and the Perizzite dwell in there in verse 8. And Abram said to Lot, let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee. Stop the strife. If there's strife in any area of your life, stop the strife because the strife stops the blessing. Because strife steals the word. Strife and offense. So then they split. And now let's go look at verse 14. You see, up until that time, the blessing wasn't working in Abraham's life. Abram's life, he was Abram at that time. Verse 14. And the Lord said unto Abram, after that law was separated from him, after that strife had stopped, after that he got back on God's plan, Lift up now thine eyes and look from the place where thou art northward, northward and southward and eastward and westward. For all the land which you see, to thee will I give it and to thy seed forever. So the blessing was reiterated. Strife's gone. Once again, the blessing. But notice, God said, and to your seed. So he's telling Abraham again, look, here's the blessing. It's for you and for your seed. Chapter 15. We're talking about mental ascent. Now he was told about the blessing again. He got rid of the strife. It's to your seed. Chapter 15. Verse 1 to 3. Now remember, we read... And to your seed forever. Forever means a long time. 15.1. After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision saying, Fear not. So obviously Abraham was having a problem with fear. Which we know because of the wanting his wife to uh, lie. Because he figured they'd kill him to get her. No faith in the blessing. God already told him, I'll bless you. If he figured somebody could come in and kill him, there's fear. Fear not, Abram, for I am your shield and thy exceeding great reward. And get this. And Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing I go childless? And the steward of my house is this Eleazar of Damascus. And Abram said, behold, to me. You have given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine heir. God just said, hey, hey, Abraham, just the chapter before that. Hey, Abraham, it's probably all the same conversation. To you and your seed. Now he's saying, God, you haven't given me a seed. Because he didn't see it instantly or whatever. That's mental ascent. God tells us he's got a plan and a purpose. We go, God, I don't see it. But notice how Abraham messed up. Sometimes we think we've messed up, we've messed up, we've messed up. I'm in the wrong path. 
and we think we're stuck. We're never stuck. God has a plan for you. He doesn't change his mind on what that plan is. It's up to us to walk in it. When God told Abram to leave his family and he took Lot, did God come down and smack him upside the head and say, Lot, you stay? He did not. God will let you do whatever you want to do. But he will guide and direct us and reveal to us what we should do. So now, again... Abraham saying, you've given me no seed. This is mental assent. Agreeing in the natural realm of God and not believing the word of God. There was no faith involved at that point. And behold, verse 4, the word of the Lord came unto him saying, this shall not be your heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be your heir. And then he brought him out. Look at the stars. Verse 8. And he's still fussing with God. And he said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? He wants a sign. He's still walking in mental ascent. How many of us were saying, God, show me. Give me a sign. And he says, I've got the Holy Spirit within you, leading, guiding, directing you. I've given you my word. So then he goes on, and verse 6, it says, Anyway, he believed God. It was accounted unto him for righteousness. It was counted to him. He was not made righteous, but the fact that he believed God, it was counted to him for righteousness. Verse 8, he asked for a sign. Verse 11, he, he cut these animals up in verse 11. And when the fowls came down upon the carcass, Abram drove them away. And I believe that's again a parallel to Mark 4 where Satan comes immediately to steal the word that was sown. Satan tried the fowls. Satan tries to steal the covenant blessing. Because you know that's covenant talk. As soon as you're killing animals and there's blood, you know. It's covenant. And it goes on to these. And verse 18. In the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abraham saying unto thy seed. Now he's saying again unto thy seed. Have I given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river. The river Euphrates. And so what happens after all of this. He turns around and in chapter 16 decides to have an Ishmael. And to this day, Ishmael is causing a problem. He was still walking in mental ascent of what God would do. Because if he wasn't, he would have never decided to try it his own way. How many of us have ever gone, God wants us to do something, go... Yes, and you run forward and you do it your way and it's not God's plan or way at all. And you end up with an Ishmael. Well, as you go on, Isaac was born to him, the seed. And so even if we mess up, We still, God has that plan for us. We can still work and walk in that plan. But sometimes are messing up because we refuse to take the time to get into the word of God and get revelation knowledge and we're wandering around with mental ascent. We refuse to get the plan of God right away. We end up with some Ishmaels. And sometimes the Ishmael won't go away. He didn't go away. Ishmael did not go away. And he's still causing problems today. Let me tell you, you young people here, you find out God's plan and purpose for you. You find out how God, who God wants you to marry. Don't you let your emotions dictate who you're going to marry. You make sure it's a one that God has planned for you. That'll stand with you according to the word of God and the covenant of God. Don't get sidetracked. 
by someone of the world. Someone that won't stand for God. That's weak. Anemic. That comes along and sounds good because a mental ascent and speaks the word okay. But has no substance in them. You find that out. You find that out through talking with them. Not becoming intimate with them. You become intimate with somebody, you're stuck. Because suddenly your emotions will control you and you'll have problems making the right choice. Now that's just free, but that's for the youth. Or young people, people that want to get married. That's serious. Don't mess around. You'll live a life of heartache. Well, so much for that. Let's go back. But you see, this is what he did. He ended up with an Ishmael. And it caused a problem. But he was still walking in mental ascent. God had a plan for Abraham. But did God force his will on Abraham? And he won't force his will on any of us. He just doesn't do it. And if we're going crazy, down the wrong path, the Holy Spirit will rise up. The Holy Spirit will tell us. The Holy Spirit will bring people across our path. And it's up to us to accept it or reject it. But God will not force us. And if you feel a push, like an outward push to do something, mark it down. It's probably the devil. Or your, your emotions being stirred up to do something you shouldn't be doing. As, as I, I think I've, I said this last week. Norval Hayes once said, never sin. Never. Never sin. Never, never, never sin. Never. Never, never sin. And he went on and on and on. And then he goes, problem with sin is you do it once and you'll end up liking it. And sin has pleasure for a season. But when that season is gone, it will kill you. Because sin leads to death all the time. When that season of pleasure is gone, it'll bring death in your life. So never touch it. Don't even think sin. Get your mind pure. Think on things that are pure and lovely and of a good report. If there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on those things. And it'll keep your life pure. I was reading this book. We're back to the youth here, but anyway. I was reading this book. And um, it's actually, this was kind of leading towards girls. But I'm going to say it works for boys too. That sometimes girls dress in a provocative way because they get the attention of young men. Young men, don't let women dress provocatively get your attention. And so they sample with a provocative woman. But every one of those men that have gone wanting this provocative woman, the woman they look for to marry is one that's pure, holy, and clean. Dressed well, not showing off her wares. So that not showing off your wares is good for all ages. On a male or female. You see, it'll kill you. It will destroy you. If you're not dressed real cool or showing off a lot of stuff, you might not get the whistle or the attention. But let me tell you, God has the right one for you. And that right one will come. Just make sure you're pure for that right one. Hallelujah. Glory to God. While Abraham went and decided to have a session with Hagar and he had an Ishmael. He still was in the case of being in a place of mentally assenting. Let's not have a session with what the devil's offering. Let's find the right place, the right plan, God's plan for us. 
Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Well, at some point we will continue. We're going to go from how Abraham came from a place of mentally assenting to being fully persuaded that what God promised, he was well able to perform. And how his focus changed. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah.